Welcome, everyone. My guest today is lead analyst Logan Motoshami to talk about the latest jobs data and all the inflation reports that we got last week and what that means for what the Fed's going to do next. We also recap the housing debate we had last week. So it's going to be a lively discussion. We may have just gotten back from Gathering of Eagles, but we're not done with events for 2023 yet. This October, we're headed right back to Austin, Texas for Housing Wire Annual, and we want to see you there. We've got a power-packed agenda with content such as our Women of Influence speakers, peak performer playbooks, CEO playbooks, and more to propel your company forward, as well as a bunch of networking events. Because this event is open to real estate executives, mortgage title, and everyone in between, you really have the opportunity to network with people from all across the housing ecosystem. If you want to learn more about the event, or if you're already ready to get registered, head over to housingwire.com on the events tab and you can learn all about it. Not to mention, if you're an HW Plus member, you're going to get 50% off your ticket. So get registered for HW Plus and get registered for the event so we can see you out in Austin. Logan, welcome back to the podcast. It is wonderful to be here. And I got to say, this this is the Fed's week. The Fed is... Right now, we're doing this on Jobs Friday. They're all smiling. They're toasting, you know, drinks to themselves. Uh, the Fed has, is finally starting to get what they want uh, uh, on the Labor Week because it was uh, Jobs Week this week. It was. So, you know, recap the labor data for us that we got all week, including what happened the, the day we're recording this, which is Friday morning. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of the chart details is uh, in the... Uh, um, jobs report article, which I'm going to make sure Sarah doesn't take my charts away this time, you know, so <laughs> we're having our little chart war here. War of the Roses. Um, in this case, uh, the Federal Reserve has told us they're attacking the labor supply. So they believe that the labor market is too tight and they want more people, you know, uh, the labor supply to grow. So the, in that context, the unemployment rate rises, uh, job openings falls down, the quit ratios fall. So this is it. This is the week that uh, job openings have fallen from 12 million to under 9 million. That's a big enough move for them to be very happy. I, I always target 7 million for them. Uh, that's where we were pre-COVID. Uh, um, the quits ratios, which is even more important, uh, where people, people usually quit their jobs to go uh, work for a higher wage job. That quit rate percentage is back to pre-pandemic level. So victory for them. They got what they wanted. Uh, in the jobs report, it's it's a bit of a funky jobs report. The unemployment rate went up just because the labor force pool went up a lot. Uh, revisions were negative. So the job growth data is slowing down, but it's still still very healthy at this point. We're still not back to levels to where I would, you know, where I talk about we, once we get back to 157 to 159 million jobs, the job growth should noticeably slow. We're not there yet, but we had the strike from the actors and, uh, you know, one of the trucking firms filed for bankruptcy. So they had to lay off other people outside of that wage growth is slowing down. Um, the fear of the 1970s entrenched inflation where wages spiral out of, out of control. And I had a very good question. Why, why, why is that such a big deal? So, uh, I think people have to remember that when inflation takes off, wages have to compensate. That's what they don't want, except Wage growth, you know, using the BLS data has been slowly moving down since the start of 2022. So there, it's going the other way from a wage spiral. So this is it. The Fed has gotten what they wanted, right? Uh, uh, it, it hasn't got to where I call the, the pivot, you know, where jobless claims isn't above 323,000 on the four-week moving average, but the labor market is less tight based on their own data lines that they told us to focus on. So if the Fed isn't happy now, they should be. It should have been done with the rate hikes, three rate hikes go. But now, if they're not, if they're not, you know, focusing on this positive for them, then we all have to assume that they had no intentions of doing a soft landing. They wanted a job loss recession because they've got what they wanted. Wage growth is down. Quits quits rates are down. Job openings are down. Job growth is slowing down. The labor force is is picking up. So. This is it. This is their week. They should, you know, toast the champagne and say, we're done with rate hikes. We're just going to hold it here until we break something and move on. We'll see if they do that. But still, I think uh, uh, from, from, their, from their side, they've attacked the labor market enough. 
So that has been, you know, your key for the last year is like looking at the labor market and looking at that 323,000 level and saying that's when they're going to pivot. How far away from that are we? We are, we're still, we're still a while away. We're kind of, you know, we're, to me, once we get to the headline numbers over th- uh, 300,000, then we could start talking about it because we, you could have these big headline numbers come up and down. It's the four week moving average which is uh, nowhere close to 323,000 yet. But the key is job openings falling as they have should get them to, I mean, not pivot, of course. I'm not a Fed pivot person, but this is what they wanted. Uh, uh, this is, they, they have talked about the job openings data. It's a lot of people hate the job openings data. It's a big thing for us, Sarah, because we were the only people on planet earth that said job openings are going to get to 10 million in this recovery. And voila, they got to 12 million. In any case, that to me means that their tone should change a little bit, right? The, uh, or else they could just finally say, hey, listen, we didn't care. We just wanted a recession. And then a recession is the only way to defeat 1970s inflation. So I think it's it's on the onus on reporters and everybody to start pressing them even more and more as credit card delinquencies are starting to rise and we're starting to see construction um, projects being pulled or not even started because, you know, rates are too high. Construction loans, uh, have skyrocketed. We're starting to see multifamily projects that were supposed to be starting soon getting pulled. So we're getting to that level now to where the higher rates are starting to impact future supply and data that we can see. So I think that's, that's another key that if you overstay your welcome, you are diminishing the things that you need to defeat inflation. And uh, uh, this would be a good time for them to take a look in the mirror and go, okay, we could lighten things up a bit. Okay, so I'm confused because I thought if the inflation data showed that, you know, it's cooling, that would be good for rates. And yet that is not what happened on Friday morning. So please explain what is going on with rates. Okay, so the 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 bond market had a puking event. It's like you know me. What does that you know, mean? I, I'm 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 just saying I'm I'm gonna give you my simplest answer. It's like me out last night partying for my birthday, and I came to the trading. Oh my god, it's the first day of the month trading, and it's the Friday before the holiday. So uh, some days this happens, whether the yields go up or down, you just have a puking of the bond market, and. I tell you this, the the 10-year yield initially went lower on the reports. I think a lot of people saw the headlines and didn't read the data yet. And then we had uh, better construction numbers. The uh, ISM number was good. And it just puked. It's a light trading day. uh, um, And the short-term rates actually went lower first. So some days, you're just going to have to just say the bond market puked. And uh, uh, that's it. You should just take it as that. Then we go back to normal again. This happens from time to time. Um, but you know, first day of the month, and this is a good thing to remember in the future, always be mindful of the first day of the month. If it's especially before a holiday weekend, some things could get wild. I think the 10 year yield went to 406 to 420. I think last time I checked it was 416. So we'll see how it ends at the day, but it's a pretty, pretty wild day. And I'm going to chalk it up to uh first day of the month, Friday before weekend, Crazy uh, jobs Friday day, and these things can be wild up and down. So we'll we'll wait till the close, and then we'll take it from next week. This is going to be published on Monday, which is Labor Day. So I guess the, my question to you is: Do we expect that inflation data, the cooling data we saw all week, to affect rates going down for this for what will be the week of Labor Day? What I'm focused on with the ten-year yield is. You know, we we had a four and a quarter peak ten year yield, and I said, is as, as long as the economic data stays firm, we can go up there. Now, what occurred is that and it, this might sound silly, okay, but this is actually true. The ladies are boosting GDP this quarter, right? Of uh, uh, Taylor, um, Barbie, you know, their their uh, ec- economic impact is a one shot to GDP, and the, the economic data was good. It was good. I mean, the labor data is cooling down, but the economic data is good. So we're we're starting to get to another phase of the economic cycle. Um, student loan debt payments are starting to become true. The cost of uh, uh, lending or cost of projects are so high that we're starting to see projects being taken out. So the next 12 months is going to look a little bit different than the last 12. Even though the growth rate of inflation has been falling from the peak, 
it's still at an elevated level that warrants where the 10-year yield should be. And in some cases, you might even say the 10-year yield should be a little bit higher where it, where it is right now. But in this case, the 10-year yield never bought into the 1970s inflation. If it did, it would have gone to five and a quarter last year. Um, so it's just working its way through. I always thought the labor market had to get softer. Now we're softer, not breaking. Breaking means jobless claims gets over 323,000. I have repeated that same line for as long as we started this uh, 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 Fed talk and we're not there yet. So there's a difference between the labor market cooling down, not being as tight, still functioning, and breaking. I think a lot of people, you see this in a lot of stock traders. They're just, they're just keep on talking about, you know, the slowdown of jobs and where the recession's coming. We did this in the previous expansion where the job growth numbers were very low and they kept on going for many years. Um, so breaking is different. Breaking is a jobless claim. This is why I've always said we, at this point, we weight claims over jolts if we're talking about breaking, but the fact that job openings is falling, the Fed is ecstatic. And, and that's, again, that's good for mortgage rates long-term, because if the growth rate of inflation is falling and the labor market is getting softer, do you know what the Fed's going to do next year? They're going to cut, right? They're laying the foundations for a Fed rate cuts if, as long as these things happen. And uh, again, it, it's I know it's frustrating because rates you know, almost came down half a percent in the week and then it shot right back up. It's, it's not a functioning market. I mean, the Fed is literally America's like swiping left on the Fed housing policy, right? So it's just uh, one of these things where it's frustrating. I get it. Uh, but uh, we're making progress to where we want to go. And that's that's the key. Uh, um, but this is like, this is a this is a very big week for the Federal Reserve. They, they're getting what they want. Okay. America is swiping left on the Fed. That might be my favorite phrase of this one so far. <laughs> And I would say, especially the the mortgage industry, real estate and mortgage. I mean, it has just been brutal. Yeah, I mean, it's it. You know, it's been so long since we've dealt with inflation and above trend growth um, that uh, a lot of a lot of people, you know, if they started in the last ten years, this is all new to them. Um, our family's been in the mortgage industry for, God, since 1987. Our family's been in banking since the late 1950s. So we, we've seen cycles here or there. But I think for a lot of a lot of people, this is brand new. And the volatility in rates sometimes is the most frustrating thing. And uh, uh, hopefully, again, like, you know, when, when I go on CNBC and try to egg the Fed on, um, you know, one of the things I said in the uh, interview this the last week was that you know, if the 10 year yield gets below 4% and there's a six handle mortgage rates, relax, just relax. Don't bring your fed people out there. And go, this is bad. I no, we can't have people buying homes. This is this relax. If you don't want the job, just quit, help the job openings data or whatever. Um, but you're, you're, you're at a different stage right now. So, uh, you, you told us to look at job openings. We did. And there it is. So, uh, acknowledge the progress. You know, it's funny. One of the fed presidents, uh, Bostick was saying, you know, I don't know if we need to hike anymore because the lag in, in uh, shelter inflation is 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 really uh, evident, and we'd be, you know, not that far from two percent if it wasn't for inflation rent. Really, duh. All of us have been saying this for like a year. Okay, so uh, acknowledge the progress and let's let's kind of move on from this stage. Uh, it's different if inflation was growing at an accelerated rate and wages were out of control and job openings were at 15 million. None of that's happening now. So land the plane, Jay, land the plane. Okay, Logan, now I wanted to um, switch topics a little bit because you and I had a debate yesterday. I moderated the debate between you and Greg Crennan, who was, uh, who's an economist, and we were talking about our home prices going to crash. And I thought it was an amazing debate. We had like almost 500 people sign up for that to, uh, to watch that. And it was very interactive. So I would, I would love to get your overall view of what the debate points were and, and what you think, uh, you know, some of the points you made. Gregory made my point for me in his final remarks when he said that people have a very low cost. And I said, exactly. And that's why a lot of people are staying in their homes. And so where's the inventory coming from? Um, let me, for those that saw the debate, I'm, I'm uh, hopefully people can understand. 
Gregory, the, the person I debated uh, yes, yesterday, and then Mohammed from last year, I would consider these people stock traders or investors. And a lot of times investors look at housing as a financial asset or an investment. That's why there was a lot of talking points he had about, hey, you can buy a CD for 5%. Who cares? What the hell does that have to do with housing? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and this is a common tactic used on Twitter, TikTok, social media outlets. And investors think like this. Um, they keep on saying this. Why would you invest in housing? You can buy a CD. That has nothing to do with the inventory channels or housing economics, right? You don't say to yourself, Sarah, imagine this conversation. Honey, we can buy a CD for 5%. Let's sell our home, go rent somewhere and put all the money into a CD and in two years earn this much amount. And then we could, you know, come on, it doesn't work that way. And this is a common theme that I've had to deal with. I just had to let him talk, right? My, my, a lot of my tactics in debating is just letting the person talk. Well, who's going to do the work for me? So in that context, a lot of the discussion was if inventory stays low and demand is stable, is there a mathematical chance to have a housing price crash? This is the, this is the same question I will ask everyone. Okay. If you are a serious housing person, you would actually say no. The variables have to change. Either demand has to collapse more because last year what we saw, we had the biggest home sale crash ever and the pricing got very noticeably weak in the second half of 2022, uh, even though we didn't end the year off with total declines, you know, because we started the year off very hot. That is that that works. That's something you could work with. But if demand is stable and inventory is low and sellers are buyers, variables have to change for the equation. Okay, so either you need an escalation in inventory, and like I've talked about, everyone who's watching this right now, look at these, look at this space. You threw COVID at me. You threw forbearance. You threw the biggest home sale crash ever. You threw seven and a half percent mortgage rates. It's never flinching. Why? I've done this long enough to know the pretenders from the winners, right? Inventory channels are run by credit channels. Credit channels, if you're looking for an escalation in inventory, you need a job loss recession, you need higher rates to save for. There's all these things that need to happen. It's not happening. Um, and that's why we're stuck here. And nobody's saying to their spouse, let's sell the house to go buy a CD or a treasury. You know, that doesn't work. So hopefully that discussion yesterday, everyone could understand the Austrian economic theories of everything the mindset of what they think from compared from a mindset from an, what a housing analyst thinks, because we have to work off of what inventory channels. Now it's not fair. Mike Simonson and myself have access to data that most of you don't have. There are things that we don't share to the public. Okay. So we know things ahead of everyone else. That's why we have an edge here. It's almost not fair. So if something happens in the inventory channel to change, We'll see it first, right? We've been here for like, what, five years talking about the Airbnb bust, right? And guess what happened? New listings data is trending at the lowest levels ever recorded in history. These two things cannot function in the same world, right? You can't have an Airbnb bust and new listings data be at all time lows. So let us guide you in the future. These debates, I mean, for, for those that follow me on social media, I was literally challenging every human being on the planet earth on a live debate last year during the biggest home sale crash because I wanted to roll every video this year because home prices are at all time highs. We're in, we're in September now. They were wrong again because these are not housing people. I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand how housing people operate. Operation is models, inventory channels, 10 year yields, not a 5% CD. I did think that was really interesting yesterday is that, um, and by the way, for our listeners, um, that will be on demand. That video will be on demand uh, this week because this is going live on Monday on Labor Day. So you'll be able to, to look it up this week because it was a really good debate in the sense of like, we really had two very opposing viewpoints. And I think the thing that struck me about what Greg was saying was that I, I couldn't, I couldn't thread the needle from what he was saying yet. We're going to have this big recession. And so home prices are going to fall. And we're like, but 
people are locked into low rates and they, they want to stay in their homes. So unless they lose their job and there's no one to sell their home to, like there just wasn't, I couldn't figure out. So how here's, here, here's, here's another interesting aspect on that. And we, we talked about that in debate. And if people are going to watch the debate again, watch what I talk about when the job loss recession happens. So let's assume 2.6 million people lose their jobs. Okay, the highest unemployment rate are high school dropouts. They typically aren't homeowners, right? Then there's the low payment aspect with a dual household income. So you got 1.3 million people that are supposedly homeowners, right? You get unemployment benefits. Then the question was, and this happens all the time, there's nobody to buy homes. Gregory said that, the people that are in COVID-19 said that. Nobody's buying homes. What happened in COVID-19? We wrote the COVID-19 recovery model. Why? Because demographics for housing were different, rates fell. Okay, if rates don't fall during the next recession, that is a viable theory. If rates fall, think of it this way. The, the way I try to re relate to humans is very simple. I have 156 million people in my army. If you, I, if you have 2.6 million unemployed people, half of them are homeowners, my army is bigger than yours. Okay, so if rates fall, right, with low sales and demand, demand is very low already. You would need demand to get to another low level for this to really work out. But what happened in COVID is we had 133 million people working. The affordability was much better than rates were lower. So we are dealing with a very different affordability metric right now. But if rates do fall and we still have 153 million people, those people just sit, don't sit there and go, I want to buy a CD. You know, I want to buy a right. CD. I'm, I, oh, rates are low. Okay. I've been waiting for two years for rates to low. Then we work off of that supply and demand equilibrium. So I'm setting the groundworks now for when that day comes, we get to do this all over again. Cause it's much different than COVID. COVID-19 COVID was in a sense easy. It was behavior. And everybody thought that who's going to buy homes. I mean, I had some of my smart economic friends keep on telling me, Logan, why do you think housing is going to rebound back? You know, who's going to buy homes? There's 20 to 30 million people unemployed. Yes, there was. There was 20 to 30 million people unemployed. There was 5 million in forbearance. That 35 million is out the door. They can't buy homes. Look at the army behind me. I've got 133 million people armed to the teeth, right? Not all of them are homeowners or home buyers or home sellers, but a, a good chunk of them are. So you, don't, you only need 4 million, right? All we need is 4 million sales to keep it stable. That's why I always refer the 4 million sales number. Right, so you have to create a variable. Either demand collapses more, or supply increases more to get this. But you can't have it to where stable demand and low inventory. See, that's that's the conversation I want to get through. And I all I need is people to talk more, and then they'll make my case for me. Because certain variables have to change. And the 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 the, the talking point was who's going to buy homes? If two million people lose their jobs, who's going to buy homes? 154 million behind me. So the rate question becomes very key in this because the affordability issues are more uh, prevalent now. There, it wasn't that bad back then in 2020. So I think it becomes a more sophisticated discussion than saying, buy CDs. Everyone's going to buy CDs. Nobody's going to buy anything but CDs. I think one of the interesting things, because I was monitoring the chat while you guys were debating and then bringing some of those questions out and what a lot of people, you know, just on top of each other kept going, but it's not just an investment, but it's not, a, but I live in my home, but, but people want to live in their homes. And I think that that's something that you always say in your, um, when we're talking, or if you write an article that this is not, it's not the same mindset. You don't listen to stock traders for housing. <laughs> Just don't listen to stock trade. Uh, there is a reason I keep on saying this, especially men, right? Men, stock traders, look at housing as an asset. So they think as an investor. So Gregory was perfect in that. He really believed in his thesis, right? Investment first, CDs or whatever, treasuries are yielding this. That's perfectly fine. A homeowner <laughs> doesn't think like that. Right, a homeowner is thinking, should I be homeless so I could buy a CD? Imagine having that conversation. No, you don't. Imagine telling the police, oh, by the way, my kids are eating from the floor uh, in, in an alley because I bought a CD. It was 5%. Don't you understand? I had to sell my house. We have to live in a world where everyone understands. Home is where the heart is, Sarah. We talked about this before. 
So people live in their homes. They have a very good low payment. The housing market is shielded, right? Captain America shield, right? Inflation, block that. Jay Powell's coming into your neighborhood saying, I want you to buy homes at higher rates so you could lose your job. Get out of here right there, right? So you have a total income restriction. It's like, it's like, I mean, when you really break it down, I always tell people, have you guys thought about the dual household income? If one person lost their job, they got unemployment benefits. Does that make their mortgage solvent because the other person's incomes and stuff like that? So there's, there's levers to pull when the next recession happens. I always think the rate variable, the 10 year yield, like I would say, housing market revolves around 10 year yield. We'll have that discussion when it, we cross that bridge, but I cannot wait to have that because as you can see, I know where, where it's coming, you know, because in 2021, um, forbearance, 3% mortgage rates, all those people that said the mortgage rate lockdown, everyone's going to go rush and sell their homes and inventory is going to skyrocket because nobody could afford homes. That's not how it works. But guess what happened? New listings data back then was trending at all-time lows. Demand was stable. So I want this conversation to happen more and more because all I need is for the other people to talk. And then they come into my domain. This is my kingdom of heaven. There is no power that we share here. So them talking about housing as an investment makes the conversation different. And I think hopefully that's something that was very evident yesterday in the discussions. And we keep it simple. If demand is stable and inventory is low, is there anything in history that we have seen in the last 500 years or even going back to the Peloponnesian War that would warrant a major home price crash. Now, if monthly supply grew, you could have total active listings stay low, but if monthly supply grew, you have something there, you know, that because it takes very long to sell a house and people have to price cut and it works. If you have a job loss recession and supply increases, yeah. but if demand is stable and inventory is low, that's, that's not it. And that's why we're sitting here. We are today, Freddie Mac, year over year, 3% growth almost year, new high. Right? There are different pricing economic models for housing economics because it's not an investment. It is the cost of shelter. It is your home. You live in it. Right, you, If you are a man, you told your wife you're going to sell your house to go buy a CD, she will boot you out of the house. Right, She's going to swipe left. She's done. Right, And you're going to tell everybody on your dating apps, we're going to buy CDs when we sell our No, swipe left, swipe left, swipe left. Right? So that's, we have to get back into that mindset, that cost of shelter, everyone needs somewhere to live, either you rent or your own. The economic structures are different right now since 2010. Logan, thank you so much. We're going to end it there. I would tell all of our listeners, go and, and get that video on demand. It was very entertaining. It was very interesting. And we... We really, it was a good discussion. So um, go look at that. See Logan in his element. I thought Greg did a good job. We both were like, you know, kudos for him for showing up and and he's very passionate about what he believes. And so, um, and and our listeners can you decide. You always show well. respect for somebody who believes in their whatever, even if you don't agree with him, at least he believed it. 99% of the people on the internet are cowards that I've challenged. They won't even dare come up, but at least he came in him and Mohammed, both of them too. They came because they believe they have conviction in what they believe in. They do. They do. And, and it was a respectful, interesting, stimulating discussion. So Logan, thank you so much. And we will talk to you again in a few days. Okay. Sounds good. 